Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The honourable member for Bass. <laughs> um, Mr uh, Acting Speaker, my uh, question is to the uh, Acting Prime Minister. I return, uh, Acting Prime Minister, to my questions of yesterday about whether the Acting Prime Minister agrees with Senator Button that a successful Turang bid for Fairfax would lead to a greater concentration of ownership of the media. Now that the uh, Acting Prime Minister has had the advantage of reading the Senate Hansard, will he simply state to the House, do you agree with Senator Button? The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. <coughs> I must say I'm puzzled uh, why you persist in uh Questioning me rather than the responsible minister. Order. As uh, the minister for transport, uh, as the minister for transport and communications said in this place yesterday, the question of ownership is essentially a question of control, and the Broadcasting Act is clear on this. If the Turing bid were to establish a control or influence over the operations of Fairfax Group by Mr. Packer, he would be in breach of the Broadcasting Act. And would be obliged to divest. The Australian Broadcasting Tribunal is currently investigating the circumstances of the Turing bid to establish whether there is any possibility of an extension of control. And it would seem to me, uh, I might say so, Mr Acting Speaker, that it would behove all members to allow this independent body to complete its investigation. The Honourable Member for Shortland. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Finance in his capacity as Acting Treasurer. I ask the minister, has his attention been drawn to calls for the government to take further action to stimulate the economy? If so, what is the government's reaction to those calls? And finally, uh, is he able to give the House an assurance that economic recovery will occur later this year? The Honourable Acting Treasurer. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, I am aware of... Uh, I am aware of calls from various quarters for the government to take further stimulatory action, uh, stemming apparently from a belief that recovery will otherwise be too slow. I think that involves a, a number of apparent misconceptions about the forecast rate of economic activity, about the degree of action already taken to produce recovery, and about the ability of other policies to produce more effective results. If I might just briefly refer to those three points in relation to the forecast rate of economic recovery. Some critics have argued that the rate of growth of GDP this year, 1.5 per cent, is uh, unacceptably low, especially because it's not high enough to increase employment. I think there's confusion here between uh, growth year on year and growth uh, through the year, because growth through this year, from the June quarter of 91 to the June quarter of 92, is uh, forecast to be not 1.5 per cent, but 3 and 3 quarter per cent, a rate of growth which uh, will certainly uh, mean that in the second half of the year we will be into employment growth, and the budget forecast is for one and a quarter per cent growth in employment in the second half of the year, giving a hundred thousand uh, increase in employment in that time. And of course, if that was continued through the whole of '92, we'd have growth in employment of about two hundred thousand. So certainly, the budget and government uh, policy is posited around a return to economic and employment growth in the near future. In relation to uh, the action already taken to produce recovery. Uh, we have uh, had uh, substantial budgetary uh, turnaround. Uh, the, an $8 billion surplus in 89-90 has now become a, a deficit of $4.7 billion uh, in this year, um, most of that turnaround, of course, being uh, due to uh, cyclical factors, but it still represents a budgetary stimulus, much of which has yet to impact on the economy. It will only impact on the economy as we go through the year. Now, we've also had a considerable reduction in interest rates. Since uh, January 1990, cash rates have been cut nine times and by 8.5 per cent. The prime rate has come down from 20.5 per cent to 13 and a quarter to 13.5 per cent. Mortgage rates have come down from 17.5 per cent to 12.5 uh, per cent. And about half of that interest rate reduction has happened within the last 12 months. So with the lags that operate in regard to monetary policy, we're still to have a stimulatory impact on the economy for about half of that action in relation to, uh, to interest rates. So both budgetary and monetary policy settings have changed considerably, and they're both acting to promote economic recovery with considerable impact yet to come. Thirdly, it's, there seems to be a belief in some quarters that we can easily accelerate economic and employment growth by more stimulatory budgetary and or monetary policies. And in regard to budgetary policy, let me say that a policy, a policy of moving to pump priming 
could produce more economic and employment growth in the short term, but Order. it would the only be most likely in the short term, and we would risk aborting the now attainable uh, sustainable long-term growth. The men for Gippsland. Adverse reactions in domestic and overseas financial markets to policies they saw as inflationary and diminishing our national savings effort would be likely to produce countervailing results that could, uh, that could uh, arrest the recovery. In regard to monetary policy, as the Governor of the Reserve Bank has explained over and over again, interest rate reductions that are not based on reduced inflationary expectations not just reduced inflation but reduced inflationary expectations will be very difficult to retain and may well prove counterproductive. So if we want sustainable lower interest rates, both nominal and real, we have to ensure that inflationary expectations are continuing to trend downwards. And any further interest rate reductions, of course, will have their impact in 92-3, not in this financial year. And nevertheless, uh, within uh, that uh, budgetary and uh, monetary policy strategy, the government is not inflexible. It's uh, prepared to take whatever further action is necessary to accentuate recovery. And of course, in that respect, I've already referred earlier this week to the review of business tax competitiveness and the review of impediments to major projects. The Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. My question for that notice is to the Acting Prime Minister. Do you agree with the Treasurer's admission in a speech to the International Monetary Fund in Bangkok overnight that Australia has indeed experienced the worst recession in 60 years? And could you explain why the Treasurer didn't have the courage to make this admission honestly in front of the Australian people? The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. Mr um, Acting Speaker, I thank uh, the uh, Honourable uh, Deputy Leader for his, uh, for his question. I think uh, that uh, when one looks at uh, the, uh, the issue of recession, one looks at uh, the question of recovery, uh, one, has to, uh, one has to look Order. at that. Uh, Order. Members well, of the opposition. Members of the opposition. Order. The member for Flinders. Mr. Acting Speaker, uh, one can uh, take one approach which suggests that it's of some value to the Parliament to make some uh, comparison as between different concession, different recessions, or can one, one can uh, do something which I think is rather more important, would look uh, at what the strategy is or what the strategies are that ought to be adopted uh, by a government uh, when it, faces, uh, when it does face economic difficulty. No one in this parliament. I warn the deputy leader of the opposition. No one uh, in this parliament likes to see uh, a period of extended uh, downturn, less does one like to see a period of recession, with the hardship uh, that uh, has been acknowledged again and again in the House. I might say that when you see uh, hardship, you can take different responses to it. And in terms of this government's response, we have sought to deal with the question of hardship as it's aligned with, uh, as it goes with, uh, with recession in a way that uh, I think is compassionate in a way that uh, has taken account uh, of the impact on people and one that uh, is uh, consonant with the earliest return of people from the workforce. That's why uh, we have uh, uh, gone to some trouble to put into place a strong social security system that supports those that are most in need. And there's never been any question, never been any question on this side of the parliament uh, that that's what our priorities ought to be. Unlike uh, on the opposite side of the House, when you have to have a full-scale debate, when you have to abort democracy, when you have to come in here in the Parliament, having failed to get a vote on your own side of the house, in your own party room, failed to secure a vote in support. Uh, uh, point of order: the leader of the National Party. Standing one four five, the minister was clearly asked, did he agree with uh, Treasurer Kerrin's statement and speech in Bangkok? He requires a simple answer, yes or no. Will you direct him back to that question? The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister is answering the question. The Acting, Mr. Acting Speaker, I was referring to the fact that, uh, that one can, uh, as uh, one saw in the uh, recession uh, uh, of, um, of uh, 1982-83, one can see a situation in which the level of payments for those most disadvantaged is cut. When one sees a situation in which uh, uh, the, the failure to develop wages policy means that recession uh, continues uh, for a number of years afterwards. Now, in terms of this government and our response uh, 
to the recession, we have sought to continue with the process of microeconomic reform. We've sought to put into place uh, those policies which will ensure sustainable recovery. There has never been a year uh, comparable to 1991 in terms of putting in place sustainable reform. This is a year in which uh, we've seen, in terms of uh, tariff policy, uh, major changes uh, that contrast with the period in which you were in government and which you failed to make any of those hard decisions in that uh, industry area. It's a period in which, uh, in terms of cooperation with the states, uh, we are putting into place uh, uh, a number of uh, reforms in terms of uh, whether it's national freight, whether it's the National Road uh, Transport Commission, whether it's the power grid. Uh, uh, significant reforms that ultimately will improve uh, the efficiency and the competitiveness of Australian industry. At the same time, uh, in the course of the last year, we've seen, uh, in terms of the government's uh, concern for those who are unemployed, uh, a commitment to uh, much uh, greater increases in terms of uh, payments uh, for unemployment benefit and payments for training programs. Now, of course, one can make uh, comparisons. But the fact of the matter is that uh, that's not of a great deal of value. It's what is one's policy, what policies ought to be pursued uh, uh, as you deal with the circumstances that we currently deal with. And in terms of this government's uh, uh, policies, we can see, as uh, the uh, minister, for, as the acting treasurer pointed out a moment ago, we've seen the impact of those policies translated into. Uh, into uh, a more optimistic uh, approach in terms of business. We've seen it in terms of uh, the prospects, as I indicated yesterday, in the housing industry of uh, revision upwards of the level of uh, growth. You can see it in terms of some improvement uh, in the area of retail sales. You can see uh, emerging a sense of recovery. Now, that recovery, to be sustainable, uh, requires the government to adopt uh, overall consistent policies. And it was the failure of your government's nerve in terms of the last recession, the failure of your capacity to develop coherent policies that led to the severity Order. that occurred uh, over a period of time and the impact on people. By contrast, uh, our government has been able to take uh, the hard and the difficult decisions. We haven't, uh, haven't balked at that. And indeed, uh, those decisions represent a coherent policy which will ensure that recovery, uh, uh, as it becomes stronger, is sustainable and that employment growth uh, uh, returns in the first half of next year to provide uh, a basis uh, for, uh, for building uh, a much stronger economy. The Honourable Member for Brisbane. Mr Acting Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Security in this House. I ask what is the government's strategy for family incomes, how is the government protecting the incomes of low-income families, and can he inform the House of the impact of alternative income strategies on low-income families? The Honourable Minister, the Acting Prime Minister, representing the Minister for Social Security. The, um, <clears throat> the, um, I thank the, uh, the honourable member for his uh, question. The uh, question referred in part to uh, a uh, package announced uh, in this year's budget, which will benefit uh, 200,000 uh, families. Particularly, uh, uh, that package will assist uh, uh, primary earners. Uh, the uh, family allowance uh, supplement threshold will be increased from 18 to 19 thousand dollars. The assets test uh, of $600,000 will be introduced for family allowances to better target the payment. The bill, of course, included uh, these reforms that were passed uh, through the House last night. I have already referred in the previous question to uh, the fact that uh, a assets test at a very high level apparently uh, proved uh, extraordinarily uh, uh, contentious in terms of the opposition uh, uh, party room. Of course, uh, family assistance is uh, especially important uh, during a time of uh, recession, during a time of high unemployment, and the fact that uh, unemployment uh, assistance uh, for the unemployed, particularly for families, uh, has uh, been increased in terms of this budget uh, is, of course, uh, very, very important. Our uh, families' policy uh, 
has very broad support and has won very broad support because it's seen uh, uh, as very well targeted uh, uh, policy. I might say that uh, during a time of recession people are particularly uh, uh, sensitive, particularly sensitive about uh, the treatment uh, of those who are unemployed, particularly families. And it's interesting that whereas uh, the opposition can have uh, the degree of contention that we saw yesterday about the uh, family allowance assets test, when it came to speaking to, uh, to ACOS, to the ACOS uh, General Congress only a couple of weeks ago, the uh, leader of the opposition made it very clear to that Congress that he felt uh, that uh, unemployment benefit and the protection of unemployment benefit and the protection of families for the unemployed and he quoted uh, the extent of increases that occurred over the life of this government uh, was in fact unwarranted expenditure, that it reflected in fact a preoccupation, uh, as he put it, uh, to ACOS with welfare uh, rather than with the situation of people in the workforce. So then you have that uh, contrast. On the one hand, uh, we have members of the opposition seriously suggesting that the threshold for the assets test should be of the order of $2 million. Uh, $2 million. But on the other hand, when it gets to those who are unemployed, those who are most disadvantaged, then the Leader of the Opposition can wander off to ACOS and make it clear that the unemployed uh, are on his, on his, uh, on his hit list. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, uh, the government is committed to uh, uh, preserving and improving uh, family assistance as an area of, uh, of some priority. That is in contrast to the Opposition particularly their lack of concern uh, for the most disadvantaged families and their willingness, of course, to go to the area of a consumption tax without being able to provide any guarantee that the most in need will be protected. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. My question without notice is again to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer the Acting Prime Minister to the statement of Prime Minister Hawke on 14 May of this year in the Parliament about the recession of 1982-83. Uh, where he said, and I quote from Hansard, there was a recession then, it was the worst since 1930. I asked the Acting Prime Minister, in view of Treasurer Kerrin's admission that the current recession was indeed the worst for 60 years, was the Prime Minister stretching the truth in this place on May the 14th, or was he simply wrong? The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. I think one of the um, characteristics uh, of this opposition is that when it comes to uh, fundamental strategies, when it comes to saying what must you do, the fact of the matter is that that question rarely can find an answer without dividing your party room. The fact of the matter is that as an opposition, you fail to come, you fail to come, uh, you fail to come into this parliament the the with any set of coherent policy. Order. In fact, uh, you can go in. Uh, members of the opposition. You can go into the parliament, uh, Mr. Speaker, day in and day out, and what you're interested in is not uh, debating underlying. Uh, uh, policy approaches. When you're not interested in debating alternative strategies. You're not interested in, uh, for example, uh, justifying why the massive effort that is going into the consumption tax might have some uh, uh, benefit uh, to the Australian people, particularly at the time of recession. You come into the parliament to make some slick uh, debating point with no interest, no interest at all in the fundamental, uh, uh, in the, uh, fundamental economic issues which need to be addressed. Now, that might uh, be your approach, but in terms of the government, you won't get a response from us. What we're interested in is the economic fundamentals that will govern the recovery. Order. Members and the on this basis, it's clear that Australia is now well positioned for a sustained recovery in investment, employment and activity. Well, uh, the, uh, the uh, Deputy Leader, Leader of the Opposition. Of the opposition. Uh, uh, leader indicates, the or the leader of the opposition uh, tries to indicate that uh, that somehow that's not uh, uh, not uh, true. But I would have thought that uh, it's now becoming clear in terms of a number of uh, uh, fundamentals, as far as the economy is concerned, that uh, we're beginning to see recovery. I uh, indicated yesterday uh, at some length, and I'm prepared to go at some length again uh, to the to the area of the uh, of the housing industry. And uh, that is a fundamental. That's, a, that's a very important in terms of uh, employment in this country. And unlike uh, in the 82-83 uh, in the recession, when housing got down to less than 100,000 starts, less than 100,000 starts, uh, we are now looking at 137,000 starts uh, this year and 155. 
thousand uh, next year. But it's not simply in terms of, uh, of those uh, particular areas of the economy. The fact, that are, the fact of the matter is that because uh, we are seeing uh, for the first time uh, in a very long time the possibility of uh, low inflation being sustainable uh, in this country, inflation at its lowest level in 20 years, then that then becomes uh, one of the building blocks in which one can build in terms uh, of being able to sustain recovery. The gross profit share remains close to the historical highs recorded under this government and is well, below, well above the levels recorded in any year under the previous government. The capital stock. Point of order, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, the Acting Prime Minister, in his opening remarks, dismissed the question that I put to him, and he has simply rambled on since. No, his, his answer, not Mr Acting of Speaker, what is, is therefore clearly, clearly out of order because it is irrelevant to the question by his own admission. Uh, the, the Acting Prime Minister is now answering the question. The, uh, the question, uh, the, uh, the question referred, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the question of uh, recession, and I'm taking the opportunity to uh, point out that, uh, in terms of uh, what is occurring now in the economy and what will occur over the next uh, uh, the next few months, we'll begin to see, and we are seeing, the process of sustained recovery. And I pointed to a number of the elements, the fundamentals, not the debating points, but the fundamentals that are there that will enable that recovery to be sustainable over the longer term. So that as uh, uh, those, um, as those uh, characteristics Order, leave the become uh, clearer and stronger, then uh, we will see uh, recovery occur, and uh, that recovery will be sustainable in the longer term. So that, that's the issue. It's not. Uh, uh, about uh, some debating point about, about uh, what uh, uh, comparisons might be made over long periods of time or how they might be interpreted. It's a matter of whether recovery is well based. As uh, the, Shadow, as the uh, Acting Party. Treasurer pointed out, uh, the recovery is well based in Australia. And uh, unfortunately for you, who spend most of your time going around talking down the Australian economy, trying to predict that, uh, that some indicator that might be optimistic uh, is not a basis uh, as the recovery uh, in this order. country will show us Mr. Mr Acting Speaker, I, I had great hope when you said that the Acting Prime Minister was now answering the question. In fact, I think you had that expectation too. Mr Acting Speaker, I ask that you direct the Acting Prime Minister to answer the question that was put to him. I believe the Acting Prime Minister has now completed his answer. The Honourable Member for Page. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. The Minister would be aware that cattle producers are experiencing significant problems because of the drought and lower than expected prices. The Minister would also be aware that cattle producers and traders have been objecting to the cattle transaction levy, under which they pay $6.25 towards marketing, research, disease control Order. each time Member Higgins. they sell an animal. What is the minister doing to lower the levy rate and change the levy system so that it does not impact so heavily on producers and traders? The Honourable Minister for Primary Industries and <coughs> Energy. I thank the uh, Honourable Member for his question, Mr Acting Speaker, and uh, indicate to the House that I had the occasion to visit his electorate uh, some uh, two months ago and the concern of the cattle producers in that region was uh, raised with me about the, uh, the form and the amount associated with the transaction levy. I might say that since that time I've had numerous pieces of correspondence from other producers and I see members from the National Party uh, nodding in agreement about that. It's as a result of those uh, discussions and indeed I would commend the role that the member for Page has played in not just bringing it to my attention but to the industry's attention that um, I'm in a position to make uh, some comments about this today. There are in fact two problems associated um, as it's been raised in concerns, Mr Acting Speaker. One goes to the form of the levy, the other goes to the amount. Now in relation to the form of the levy, the reality is that the levy falls for producers on each transaction. And the allegation 
that is made, and I think with some justification in relation to some aspects of the industry, particularly the small producers and the traders, is that that's inequitable, because some pay people will only pay it once and others will pay it more than once. And against that background, given that the form of the levy, as well as the uh, composition that goes to the amount, was recommended to us by the industry through the Cattle Council and the Meat um, Industry Policy Council, I have asked those two bodies to conduct the review, which they are currently undertaking, and it will be with me in November. That goes to the question of form. In relation to the amount, which, as the member indicates, is currently $6.25, I am in a position to inform the House today that from January 1 that rate will fall from $6.25 to $5, a 20 per cent reduction, Mr Acting Speaker, and this, comes about, and this comes about because of the significant success that has been had with the brucellosis and tu tuberculosis eradication campaign. We have reached the stage where that, uh, disease, those diseases are effectively eradicated. The scheme simply now has to move to a monitoring role. An agreement has been reached between the states and industry and the Commonwealth as to the future funding. That therefore enables us to give some immediate relief, quite apart from the review that is currently being undertaken. I simply conclude on this point, Mr Acting Speaker. This is another demonstration of where this government is prepared to listen to genuine concerns and come forward with constructive outcomes. I believe it's good news for the beef producers, and I hope that that's recognised by all sides of the House. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. And it's a simple question to which there can be a direct answer. Are we or are we not in the worst recession in 60 years? The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. <coughs> Mr um, Acting Speaker, um, the uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition uh, wants, the, the to, uh, for Bruce. wants to reduce uh, our politics down to uh, the sharp uh, debating point. He doesn't want to get down. He doesn't reflect. He's not Order. interested members in. Of the opposition. He has no concern for, um, uh, members for, the for Australian uh, for recovery in terms of the Australian economy, for building uh, that recovery on shore foundations, for debating uh, serious policy issues. Uh, all he's interested in is uh, debating points, yes, no answers, not in the substance of the issue. As I've um, been uh, uh, pointing out, and I will continue to, uh, the to point out, uh, that uh, in terms of the recession, which the government uh, regrets, particularly the impact of the recession on unemployment, uh, we are now beginning to see uh, quite solid signs of recovery. I've indicated. Uh, uh, those signs of recovery in the very, very important uh, area of the housing uh, of the, uh, the housing industry, but I could also have pointed to positive signs of recovery in other sectors. For example, the Westpac Melbourne University Index of leading indicators, a widely based barometer of early signs of change, suggests a general recovery is imminent. Consumer confidence is now well above the lows experienced in late 1990. The latest statistics for retail trade show promising signs of recovery. The foundations, then, for a stronger recovery, for a stronger economy have been laid. We have the right policy settings in place. Official interest rates have been cut by 8.5 percentage points since early 1990. Wages growth is being held in check by the Accord framework. We are maintaining the structural integrity of the budget. We are, in fact, on top of inflation. And the current account deficit fell by around 30 per cent in 1991 and will fall further in 1991-92. While the September labour force figures were disappointing, we are confident that the large falls in employment are behind us. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I go to the some detail. Mr. Act, Mr Acting Speaker, I draw your attention to the fact that the, pri the Acting Prime Minister is not answering the question that was put to him. It was a simple question whether we are or are not experiencing the worst depression for 60 years. He's reading from a brief that's obviously a there's, brief for another question, Mr Acting Speaker. There's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's no there, point, uh, of, uh, point of order. The member for Herbert. Mr Acting Speaker, on each occasion that the Acting Prime Minister has been endeavouring to answer a question, he has been persistently interrupted. 
by frivolous points of order, and I am suggesting to you that under Standing Order 302 that the actions of the honourable member for Hume and indeed previously the honourable member for Farrah constitute disorderly conduct, and that you should take action in that regard. Uh, members, members have a right to take points of order in proceedings. Uh, the chair is, however, conscious that members should not lapse over to a point where they become disruptive of the proceedings. I also might, might make the point with respect to the member for Hume's point of order that the chair is listening carefully to ensure that the acting prime minister does not go over material that he's already gone over in relation to previous answers. And until, until now, that has not occurred. The acting prime minister. Mr. Um, Mr. Acting Speaker, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to some length, and I'm emphasising the recovery, essentially because uh, what we have. Uh, is a situation which could well be unique. And it could be well unique in this sense that, uh, in terms of the history of the Australian economy, it has often been, in fact, marked by cyclical uh, booms and busts, by periods of downturn and upturn, by a lack of long term stability. When I referred to the housing industry a few minutes ago, I was referring to an example of an industry which, as long as uh, as, uh, as it has been in existence, has always been subject to cyclical movements. What is true there is generally true of the Australian economy. Now, what is required, uh, and certainly the government understands this, and one would have hoped the opposition understood, it, is fundamental structural change. It's microeconomic reform uh, in a whole range of different areas. It's a comprehensive process of reform. Now, why I believe that uh, the recovery is strong and well-based and could well be the strongest recovery, uh, certainly in the post-war period, is it is based on a recognition. It's based on a, a recognition of the international character of the Australian population, some of, of the Australian economy, something you resisted, uh, you resisted uh, in your time in government, even under the advice of a learned professor such as yourself. It's a government like no other government that's been prepared to uh, tackle tariff reform a government which has uh, been able to reverse the situation with respect to inflation and has been able to set in place a number of fundamental reforms that will ensure that recovery is sustainable in the longer term. That's what's important, uh, that uh, recovery is sustainable, and that's why I've given the uh, answer to the question so much emphasis. The Honourable Member for Perth. For, the Honourable Member for Perth. Sorry, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's fortuitous that you've given me the call because the uh, question which I'm going to ask is a topic which is close to your heart, and I ask it without notice to the Minister for Transport and Communications. Can the Minister advise the House whether reports uh, the of significant cuts in sports coverage by the ABC radio are accurate? Indeed, many uh, ABC listeners in Perth have indicated their concern to my office, and I ask also uh, was the funding to the ABC broadly maintained in the recent budget? The Honourable Minister for Transport and Communications. I do thank you. This is genuinely a question without notice, and I, uh, I do thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for his question. Not much. But um, <laughs> the, uh, to get to the latter part of his, uh, his question first, the, um, the position that, uh, with the ABC, of course, is a situation now where the government is treating the ABC appropriately with uh, great generosity in terms of, the, uh, of maintaining its real expenditures in the middle of a recession that, uh, that is no small achievement, the fact that we have been prepared to do that. It contrasts, of course, quite dramatically with the positions adopted by opposition spokesmen as far as the ABC are concerned, when the best outcome they have suggested for them is substantial cuts. And, uh, the and, and the ultimate outcome they suggest for them, if they ever get into government, is to be included in their second tranche of privatisations so, uh, and SBS. And the, um, the position that, uh, of course, that we, uh, that we would adopt here is that we wish to maintain a strong and effective national broadcast. One of the things that the ABC does insist on is that their uh, position ought to be uh, such that ministers, governments, uh, anyone else cannot interfere with the uh, way in which they choose to do their programming, or for that matter, the way in which they choose to organise their finances. 
And, uh, as a result of uh, that sort of reorganisation, there has been a substantial impact, I think, on uh, ABC Sport. Uh, I understand in the case of Western Australia that the, there were four people involved in it. That's been cut down to two, and there's a couple um, going over to news. And, uh, the ABC, of course, has built up a very substantial uh, phalanx of uh, well-known sports broadcasters in this country, and uh, any uh, and a diminution of their presence on the airwaves, I think, would be a worry to a lot of people. However, as I said, they do have control over the way in which they do things. They do point out to me, when I've raised this uh, at the behest of other members of parliament before with the, uh, with the ABC, that um, they uh, point out that Western Australia has, has probably got more local programming in sports than just about any other state. Whether that is sufficient, of course, is, a, uh, is another matter, matter, but that is nevertheless a fact. As far as they are concerned, Western Australia has more access to local sports, and therefore I suppose we would notice in Western Australia a cut if, uh, if that were occurring. Uh, all I can say is that. Um, I recognise the ABC has control over its uh, financial affairs. I note that uh, the, uh, the government has been uh, generous to the ABC in its funding arrangements this year, but in the final analysis the ABC will take decisions about uh, its programming as it sees fit. I do think there is value, however, in that uh, I'm constantly assured by the ABC that they, uh, they take note of the views of their valued listeners that if people do feel as you do about the uh, situation related to sports, uh, then you will do uh, some good in uh, persistently writing to them and approaching them about it. The Honourable Member for Benelong. Mr um, Acting Speaker, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations. And I refer the Minister to the stated policy of the government to promote greater flexibility for workplace arrangements within the present industrial relations system. In view of this, will the government intervene before the full bench of the Industrial Relations Commission next Monday to support the application of Metway Bank and its staff association for approval under section 115 of the Industrial Relations Act of their workplace agreement, which, if approved, will demonstrate that there is a significant new area of flexibility under that Act for workplace arrangements without the need for further amendment of the Act. The Acting Treasurer representing the Minister for Industrial Relations. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, of course it is the uh, policy of the government uh, to develop a much more flexible industrial relations system and uh, much of uh, what we have done in the last uh, two or three years has been uh, very much uh, to that end. In relation to the particular case that the uh, Honourable Member refers to, I'm not familiar with uh, the uh, claim, uh, but I'll refer his question to the Minister for Industrial Relations and get him an answer. The Honourable Member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. Mr Acting Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Trade and Overseas Development. Has, has the Minister's attention been drawn to comments by the leader of the National Party that Australian overseas aid ends up in the Swiss bank accounts of dictators? Has he taken any action to investigate these claims? The Honourable Minister for Trade and Overseas Development. What a <laughs> Member of the Northern Territory. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, I am aware of the uh, National Party leader's uh, extraordinary allegations uh, about uh, misuse of Australian aid funds, and I think for the benefit of those who did not hear him, this was a broadcast on ABC National Radio, uh, I'll just uh, quote uh, what he said. There is a case for aid to our region and specialised aid, but pouring aid into certain countries elsewhere in the world, some of which ends up in Swiss bank accounts of the dictators in the areas involved, others of which end up in political agendas of consequence. I feel very strongly about that, and we will be cutting back the size of the foreign aid program. Now, this, this was not a statement uh, made by some ratbag backbencher from the National Party. It was a statement made by the leader of the National Party. <laughs> Point of order. I the, know uh, that the Honourable Gentleman Point didn't have turned to uh, treat us with that disrespect, but I suggest that that euphemism should be withdrawn. Um, 
I'm certain it doesn't help the minister's answer, and I'm sure he would withdraw the euphemism about the National I'm Party. I'm happy to withdraw it because uh, it uh, was a statement made by the leader of the National Party, a man supposedly of uh, gravitas and, and authority. Now, because, as everyone would agree, those are serious allegations, it was naturally my duty uh, to follow them up. I could not leave them unexplained. So I approached the leader of the National Party uh, and sought whether there were any specifics to the allegations that he had made so that I might take uh, whatever action was appropriate. I regret to say that uh, the leader of the National Party said he did not know of any specific case in which, in which Australian aid money had been so treated. Insofar as I grasp his explanation, he'd simply been referring to general gossip that Western aid money that Western aid money was being used in this way. Now, let me say, in such a complex and diverse program as the Australian aid program, there are almost certainly going to be some misuse of funds, no matter how good. Absolutely correct. Leader of the National Party. No matter how good our preventive mechanisms are. Order the and, it is, and it is very important. It's very important that if any member of the House has a substantial piece of evidence to bring to bear on any aspect of the program, then it is my duty to deal with it. And I can assure members that if they present me with that hard evidence, it will be certainly followed up. But the unsubstantiated claims made by the leader of the National Party are just simply not worth following up. Uh, they're simply an irresponsible attack both on the integrity of the aid program but also on the integrity of our recipients. Moreover, they show an appalling lack, an appalling lack of how the program works. With the exception of PNG, which is a country not ruled by a dictator, Australian bilateral aid is very rarely given in cash. It is usually given in the forms of goods and services purchased by ADAB in Australia. And it's impossible to bank those goods and services even in Switzerland. And, and on occasions where cash and on occasions, members of the opposition, the member for Mayo. And on occasions where cash grants are used, uh, they are invariably accountable grants for specific purposes. Now we all know why the leader of the National Party made these absurd allegations. He made them in order to support the claim by the leader of the opposition that aid must be cut back. And so what we got was a simply a contemptible, a cheap and a baseless tack on the Australian aid program. The Honourable the member, for, member for Northern Territory. The Honourable Member for Maranoa. I thank you, Mr Acting Speaker, for the call. And uh, My question without notice is to the Minister for Prime Industries and Energy. It's a very serious question relating to the wool industry. And, uh, can the minister explain why six million bales worth of wool has been removed from the Australian Realisation Commission stocks held in bond in Belgium without payment to the Commission, and what steps are being taken to obtain payment for the wool removed from bonded storage? The Honourable the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Mr Acting Speaker, I am uh, not in a position to uh, respond to the specifics of the question, but I will take that uh, point on notice and uh, come back with uh, an answer. It is a uh, serious issue if what is happening is that uh, wool is uh, is being taken out, is not being properly paid for and is being used, uh, and the consequence of that is to take players from the market. Of course I'll follow it up. But I should just indicate that there have been some concerns expressed about the role that the Realisation Commission has been playing, and I have asked the Realisation Commission for reports in the past, and I'm in the process of writing to them today because I have had responses which would suggest two things. Firstly, that there have been something in the order of 135,000 bales sold from the, uh, from the stockpile, 82,000 of them which, I think, in rough figures, were sold in non-selling weeks, and all of the bales have been sold at a premium, a premium above the market, in essence because people are prepared to pay out of the stockpiles held overseas for more speedy delivery. I am also told by the Realisation Commission that uh, in practically all the circumstances of the bales sold, they are bales, they are types of wool that do not compete with that which is being sought on the, uh, the domestic market. Now, if all of that is true, 
if all of it's true, then it clearly cannot have a depressing effect on the prices for wool at the moment, which are seriously down. They are seriously down, and I think it would be in the interests of the wool industry the sooner those National prices Party. raised, the better. But I think that the assertion that I think is inherent in the honourable member's question that the Realisation Commission is acting irresponsibly is not founded. Order. Is, is not founded. Is Order. Not, Members of the opposition. I've stolen. I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I'm sorry. Well, if that's the case, I will. Uh, I will. I will undertake to. Um, um, find the, the answer to the specifics of that and uh, the member come for Mayo. back to you. The Honourable Member for Kingsford Smith. Speaker, uh, my question without notice is directed uh, to the Minister for Science and Technology. Can the Minister advise the House on the progress towards implementation of the Cooperative Research Centre's program? What are the objectives of that program and are you satisfied that those objectives are being achieved? The Honourable Minister for Science and Technology. I thank the honourable member for Kingsford Smith for his question. The Cooperative Research Centre's program was announced by the government in March of last year. The program envisaged the selection of up to 50 CRCs at a cost to the Commonwealth rising to $100 million per year. The objectives of the program include to support long-term high-quality scientific and technological research which contributes to national objectives including economic and social development, the maintenance of a strong capability in basic research and the development of internationally competitive industry, and to capture the benefits of research and to strengthen the links between research and its commercial and other applications. Mr Acting Speaker, it was always intended that there would be three selection rounds for CRCs. The first round saw the selection of 15 centres. These were announced by my predecessor in May of this year. Members may be aware that today I have released a statement indicating funding arrangements for those 15 centres. Those details indicate that the Commonwealth has committed nearly $30 million per year to fund the first 15 centres. Participants in the centres are providing resources totalling $345 million over the contract period. Industry's commitment is almost $60 million, with expectations of at least an additional $15 million over the contract period. The second round is currently underway and an announcement of the successful second round applicants will be made by the government in December. The third round will be conducted in 1992. Mr Acting Speaker, the program to date has achieved much and is soundly based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Members, however, may be aware of my recent speech at the ANZUS con uh, Congress where I said in part that I was not currently persuaded that the program had to date successfully focused on achieving a commercial outcome from research. I am, however, confident that that will occur. The CRC program as a whole must have appropriate and real industry participation and a clear focus on the commercialisation of research, although in some centres the most relevant research users may be Commonwealth and state agencies. I will be meeting tomorrow with the uh, CRC committee as part of the second round process. That process is not a static operation and refinements on the way will ensure the program's success in achieving its objectives. In addition, Mr Acting Speaker, consideration is currently being given to the guidelines for applicants for the third and final round of CRCs. These guidelines will be a clear signal to industry that the government's focus for the program is on industry participation and on the commercialisation of research. That is a signal which industry must pick up. Industry participation in CRCs is a two-way street. So far as the government is concerned, the signpost is quite clear from our perspective, and I trust that industry will proceed accordingly and will take up the initiative. The program is an exciting one in which industry must participate and maximise the national benefits which flow from it. Mr Acting Speaker, the CRC program is a great initiative of this government. It has not been easy to implement, but constant attention is being given to ensure that it successfully meets its objectives. I note in closing, Mr Acting Speaker, that, uh, as is uh, quite often the case, the opposition spokesman, the honourable member for Gippsland, is behind the pace on this issue. And I refer to Order. the uh, Order. I refer to the September issue of the respected science uh, journal Search, where uh, the honourable member is reported as saying that his main concern 
was with the heavy emphasis on commercialisation of science, possibly at the expense of basic research in universities. So his view is less commercialisation, not more. I trust that in this, as in other areas, that the, the honourable member for Gippsland will continue his tradition of getting on the correct policy line some two or three months after everyone else. The honourable member for Hawker. My question, without notice, is to the acting prime minister. Is it appropriate conduct for the prime minister, while representing Australia overseas? to publicly upbraid a female journalist from the Sydney Morning Herald, Ms Polita Clark, by using a generous helping of four-letter words, leading to a British journalist to describe the Prime Minister Order. as— Order. Um, I must I say quote, that the, uh, the question— the, the questions in this place must be directed to ministers and prime, acting prime ministers with respect to their matters of public uh, of, uh, responsibility. Take, I take the point of order. I take the point of order that um, surely, when the prime minister is out of this this country, the, the uh, oh, you will sit down. You just sit down. You sit down, Vizzi. You, you sit down. I, I took the point of order, and he gave me the call, and you keep no. quiet. In Mr. fact, I take the point of order. In fact, the member for Benelong is wrong. I have, I am yet to seek his guidance. I'm about to give a decision on it. I was to suggest to the member for Hawker that she, she redirect her question. She, I'm, uh, should say, she reword her question so that it falls within the, within the standing orders. So I'll give the member for Hawker an opportunity to reword her question and it, it, so that it falls within the standing orders. But Mr. Now you have a point of order. Yeah. Well, well, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting Speaker, I, t I rose to a point of order because you indicated, by way of interruption to the member for Hawker that questions had to be directed to people in areas touching upon their portfolio responsibility. Now I took that to be I took that to be an instruction or a piece of advice to the member for Hawker that she could not proceed to ask the acting prime minister a question about the conduct of the prime minister overseas. Now I take the point of order that if you can't ask that of the acting prime minister, who on earth can you ask it of? There, because there is nobody, no, 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 no. there is nobody, you, you there is nobody else order. there who is capable of asking to the prime minister. You are now proceeding to make a speech. The, the point is, the point is, the acting prime minister is responsible for the conduct within his area and for the prime minister in respect to official activities overseas. And. And I am, yet to be, I am yet to be enlightened by the member for Hawker that her question falls within that parameter. I've, and I've already indicated to the, the member for Hawker she will have an opportunity to reword her question, and she will, I, I'm sure she's in the process of doing that. In the meantime, I will call another, another Mr. question. Mr Acting Speaker, on a point of order. Mr. Acting, yes. Mr Acting Speaker, on a point of order. You should hear the question before you rule on it. Yet yeah, I have to say to the member for Hume, the amount I'd heard so far, it fell outside the standing no. orders. It would have to correct itself enormously to fall within the standing orders. Well, 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 now, now, what about if no, you keep no. quiet and behave yourself? Now, I'll hear, I'll hear, I'll hear the member for Hume. <coughs> Mr Acting Speaker, Mr Acting Speaker, I seek your guidance. As to, to, to whom could that question be directed? Because it is a question of public importance that should be asked no. in this chamber. I've, I've already indicated that if the matter relates to, to specific Number portfolio up. responsibility, however, I have to say that at this stage the matter is hypothetical. First of all, on the first test, it's hypothetical. I'll then, I'll now call. The I'm, I'm, I'm not assisted by members of the opposition who persist in interjecting. The matter at this stage was still hypothetical. There was no way of testing whether it was within public responsibility, and to that extent it was out of order. Now I'll hear the member for Hawker to see whether it is in order. Um, Mr Acting Speaker, do I uh, have your permission to read through the question again so I can have a determination? Because I am a little unclear of where we are. If it's a stage. repetition of what you've said so far, it's out of order because it's hypothetical. I will However, then I'll, let I'll, I'll let you. I will then change the wording of the question, Mr Deputy Speaker. Please proceed. Um, while representing Australia overseas, 
The uh, Prime Minister publicly upbraided a female journalist from the Sydney Morning Herald, Ms Polita Karg, by, using, by swearing at her, leading to a British journalist to describe the Prime Minister as, and I quote, a foul-mouthed little man. <laughs> will, the, will the acting Prime Minister be seeking asking the Prime Minister if he will apologise to the journalist in question? <laughs> Order. I would have to say that, the, that for the, from the point of view of the conduct of the House, I will, I will. If the members of the opposition, if the members of the opposition would would retain some dignity in the place. I am about to say that. Whilst the question itself may well fall outside the standing orders, I will ask the, Prime Minister, the acting Prime Minister to answer the question. The acting Prime Minister. Well, I must say that uh, the opposition has specialised uh, this week. I think maybe it has been an honour of my acting position, but they've specialised in asking me questions in which uh, they seem to have access to some information which certainly I don't. Think. I certainly uh, don't. I, I, I've got no idea what the basis. Uh, uh, of the question might be, so therefore it's hypothetical, and so therefore I have nothing of any further substance to add. The, Mr. Acting the Speaker, Honourable Member Mr. for Acting Banks, Speaker, on a point of order, uh, the member for Hume may have his point of order. He didn't have the call, but I'll give him the point of order. Well, Mr. Acting Speaker, on a point of order, the Acting Prime Minister was asked whether he would seek a public apology from the Prime Minister. No, no. The, the, uh, the, the member for Hume should not abuse the privilege. The acting Prime Minister had indicated, the, from his point of view, the question was hypothetical, and I might add, incidentally, that it simply confirmed the view of the Chair that the question was already out of order. The Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Acting Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Transport and Communications. Has the Minister seen comments proposing an agenda for reform on the waterfront, aviation and telecommunications? In addition, to the measures already in train, what other action could be taken to further reform those areas? The Honourable Minister for Transport and Communications. Yes, I have seen uh, references made by the uh, Leader of the Opposition to the area of microeconomic reform. Yet again last night when he got into this place, he stood up here and gave his usual litany and he said we will reform aviation, we will reform the waterfront, we will reform uh, telecommunications. What we have never actually ever heard from him, and this is how he proposes to do it, we have some, sorts of, uh, we have some sort of indication on this. So we've got the, the notion that he'll introduce <coughs> troops on the waterfront. That's one of his great schemes that, uh, that he intends to uh, bat on with. That's the sole indication thus far of what changes he expects to see there. What I might say on the waterfront is that under the reforms that we have introduced, we are now getting very good productivity gains indeed, far better in fact than we anticipated, so much so that virtually by the end of this year the uh, performance on our waterfront is going to be up to the standards that uh, are being experienced now in some European and Japanese uh, ports because the reforms have produced 70 per cent improvements in productivity and, uh, of course, that has been accompanied with a large number of people—1,800 to this point—leaving the waterfront. There are substantial changes taking place there on the ba only basis which changes can effectively take place. That is, they are jawboned. That is, somebody sits down and goes through the solid, hard yakka of talking their way through with the waterside workers, with the union movement generally. The solid, hard yakka. Now, uh, it is, the opposition has absolutely no view about how that ought to be done. And then we go into the area of telecommunications. All that we have actually heard from the opposition in reform in the area of telecommunications is a notion of privatising telecom. Anybody who studies any of the areas where privatisation of the main carrier has been made the principal pro focus of reform will note this. The principal focus of reform a privatisation it means inevitably that what happens is that decisions are taken persistently over time to favour the main carrier in order to uh, ensure that a proper price is achieved on behalf of the taxpayer's investment. Now we will see that again from the opposition. I'll bet London to a brick, London to a brick 
that when, the, when Point of order. The member for Isaacs. Mr Acting Speaker, it relates to Standing Order 145 and answers being relevant to the question. In fact, uh, I listened carefully to the question and uh, it was in and order the under has, Standing Order 144. The Chair has listened carefully to the question and the question is in order. There's well, no point of so order. The Honourable Minister. The member no longer has have, the call. The Honourable Minister. I haven't Minister. concluded my point of order. Oh, come on. Stop the tying the chair. The, the member no longer has the call. I heard your point of order. You, there's no point of order. The Honourable Minister. I will bet London to a brick that sitting in the middle of the proposition on the consumption tax will be this. There will be included an element of privatisation in order to achieve savings in the budget, in order to justify tax cuts. London to a brick, I'll bet you that, sits in the middle of their propositions. And when, and when we see that, Order, and when for we see that, we will know this. When we see that, we shall know this. The leader of the opposition. We will know that, for as far as the opposition is concerned, now you, Order, you just, you just rabbit on in this place. I have never seen, I have never seen a leader of the opposition given the latitude you have. You rocked into this place a couple of years ago, saying that you're going to improve the standards in here, and your behaviour as a leader of the, leader of the opposition has been an absolute disgrace. Order, order. But no the order. The, 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 minister, order. Order. the minister will resume his seat. Point of order. The member Mr. for Acting Isaac. Speaker, the comments, understanding order 145. The answer is not relevant to the question. The minister is trying to address comments to the leader order. of the opposition, which is totally out of order with the question that was asked. I'd ask you to either ask order. you to get him to either get back to the question or sit down. Yeah. Order. There's no point of order. I'd, I'd remind the member for Isaacs that he's been persistently interjecting during the during the answer. I might also add that the reason the minister strayed off the answer was because the leader of the opposition was provoking him by interjection. Yeah. The honourable the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To get back uh, to the point. Uh, point what of order, the member for Burke. What? Oh, wait for The Mr. member Speaker, for Burke. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Acting Speaker, it ought to be it ought to be very clear to you now there is an orchestrated campaign to disrupt question time, and you should put a stop to it. No point of order. The now, we, will see, we will see that program of privatisation put in place to, do, to justify budget cuts. Now, what we can be absolutely sure of then, if that is the motive, if that is the motive for the way in which they intend to deal with telecom, we know that they will constantly and persistently, because the whole of their policy will hang on it, they will constantly and persistently seek to augment the value of telecom as they sell it to the detriment of competition. It will not be competition. It will not be the efficiencies for business that come with that. And of course, that is all of a piece of what their intentions are. Because not only will they defend the value of telecom in order to pay at one level for their consumption taxes and, and income tax cuts associated with it, they will also be loading onto the system overall a 12.5%, 15%, whatever consumption tax, diminishing what gains there are business and for the ordinary citizen that come from competition in the telecommunications area. So we know that the position that they adopt in the area of competition for telecom, because they've said nothing different from us, nothing all, at all different from us apart from the privatisation of telecom, we now, we now know from the opposition, we now know from the opposition that they have absolutely no intention at all of microeconomic reform in the area. And then we come down to the area of aviation. Again, the opposition rabbits on on the subject of aviation. What on earth do they expect to do? Order the leader of the National Party. That happens to be different from what we have done in the total deregulation of the domestic aviation system. I tell you what they intend to do. They intend to put 12.5% or 15% or whatever it is on the price of every ticket. That will be microeconomic reform in the aviation area. Competition in aviation. What do you, what, oh, how do you get more competition than by privatising uh, The Australia minister should not respond and, and to interjections. By, and, and by, uh, Opening up. What the Leader of the Opposition just says then is he's going to get more planes. <laughs> the, the Leader of the Opposition clearly has an extraordinarily intelligent appreciation of the way, of the way, in, which the aviation, the way in which the aviation system operates. Well, we now do know that, that, like everything else that the Opposition stands for, it has all been subsumed. All their brave positions on microeconomic reform. 
all their brave rationale for privatisation in the area of efficiency. It's all been subsumed by one objective. How do you establish the financial basis to justify the introduction of a tawdry old goods and services tax? This, then, is the hope of the future that the opposition offers this country. We will subordinate every element of policy in this country to introduce for you a goods and services tax, and we want you to vote for us. Well, uh, that'll do. I mean, that'll be a reasonable basis to fight the, the next election. The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. Ask for that question to be placed on note. The Leader of the Nation.